This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Laura Lotka, and I'm here with my co-host, Renee Williams. And today in studio, we have three guests to talk with us about urban forestry. First, we have Nick Williamson, and Nick works in the uni- at the University of Kentucky as the Urban Forest Initiative Coordinator. And then next, we have Heather Wilson, and she is a municipal arborist with the Lexington Fayette Urban County Government. And our third guest is Emily Ellingson, and Emily is the Curator and Native Plants Collection Manager at the Arboretum State Botanical Garden of Kentucky. And it's a pleasure to have you three in studio today to talk about about all the great events we have for the month of April kind of pertaining to trees. But before we get started with talking about these activities that we're going to have in April, tell us a little bit about your background and what you do in your job. Nick, I guess we'll start with you. So I'm, I'm the coordinator for the Urban Forest Initiative. We do two main things. One is we're uh, involved with outreach and education in urban and community forestry. And then the other one is we work with and host bi-monthly meetings as part of the UFI, the Urban Forest Initiative. Sorry, that's our acronym. Working group, who's a collaborative entity of city, state, federal, land managers, etc. A bunch of folks who are involved with urban forestry around the central Kentucky area. And Heather, how about you? Sure. My name is Heather Wilson. I am the Municipal Arborist with LFUCG, as you said. For us, basically what we do is anything tree-related that has to do with public trees. So we are in charge of planting, caring for, pruning, and managing all the trees in our public spaces. Um, And those areas really kind of include our medians, which are those big greenways down like main roads, like Richmond Road, also in parks, and then at our numerous facilities around town. So there's like the Furrows building out on Versailles Road, or there's all of the little buildings around the Ag Extension area off of Red Mile Road, and any of those kind of city-run places that have mm. trees involved with them. We do a lot of outreach with the public. And when people have questions about trees in their neighborhoods, we often go in and talk with them about our role as a city and, and what we can do to help them with their trees or what really their responsibilities mm. with trees are. We manage the street trees to a certain extent, and we work with a lot of people to put trees into the ground where they want on public space. Great, thank you. And Emily, how about you? Great, I'm Emily Ellingson. I'm the Curator and Native Plants Collection Manager at the Arboretum State Botanical Garden of Kentucky. Uh, The Arboretum is a 100-acre green space in Lexington uh, and the UK campus. We have three main components, the Horticultural Gardens and Displays, the Kentucky Children's Garden, and then the Walk Across Kentucky, which is 80 acres of native plants. Hmm. We're a public garden and a living museum. Our uh, mission is to showcase Kentucky landscapes and serve as a resource for environmental and horticultural education, research, and conservation. Great. Thank you. We ask this question a lot just because we're always curious. What got you first interested in forestry? Nick, go ahead. (laughs) Probably climbing trees in my backyard as a kid. There you go. Just like being outside always, like learning about nature, being around it, having Mm -hmm. dirt on my hands, things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Did my undergrad here at UK in natural resources and environmental science, and that helped me realize that, wow, there could actually be a profession in me doing this. So that's my pathway. What about you, Heather? Mine was actually the Red River Gorge. I actually came to Kentucky from Maryland as an equine science major here at UK. Uh UK and Maryland, some of the schools in Maryland anyway, have what's called a Commonwealth program. And so I was able to get in-state rates to come to Kentucky. I got here and not really knowing anyone in the equine business, I didn't really know my way into it. Mm -hmm. And I met some really great people my freshman year that introduced me to the gorge here in Kentucky. And I had never been much of a hiker, always outdoors, but not much in the woods. And I just, I fell in love with it. I always knew I didn't want to sit at a desk all the time. I wanted to be outside. And looking back, I realized that I always was kind of envious of those kids that did like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and could ID the trees that were out there, but Mm -hmm. never really understood that. And so then I knew that my next path was to deal with the forest. Mm -hmm. That's great. Emily? I think similarly to Nick, it was uh, (laughs) climbing trees in my front yard. I just loving to be out, loving being outside. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Mm -hmm. 
from Minnesota. I went to uh, my undergraduate was at a small liberal arts college, St. Olaf College, uh, where they didn't have a horticulture program, so I wasn't really introduced to that in college. But after that, I went into the Forest Service and did botany surveys in Washington State. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of similar to Heather, the first time I'd really been outside hiking and in the woods a lot. Um, And from there, I I did AmeriCorps at a botanical garden, and that kind of cemented my interest in public gardens and in forestry. And I got my master's at the University of Minnesota. And yeah, now I'm here. So, well, thank you for telling us about your background. And I know you kind of mentioned about your different organizations and a little bit about them. Tell us kind of what they do here in the city and and what their role is maybe for the, the Lexington citizens. The Urban Forest Initiative As mentioned, we do a lot of outreach and education. So the way that takes form is in sort of like traditional classroom visits. We do seminars, community service events, workshops, really involving people. We try to involve people K through 12 and adult. That's one way we involve people. But I'd say also the the Urban Force Initiative Working Group is important for our region because uh, it's a collaborative network of lots of people who are involved with urban forestry issues who are all able to meet in the same space and uh, share information, share resources, and hopefully take on bigger and more collaborative sorts of events through that sharing of um, information that Mm. happens. Kind of before we get much farther, tell us about the importance of urban trees and why urban forests are important and and why it's so important to, to have these working groups and to have these discussions and to have these outreach events. Trees make people happy. <laughs> That's, uh, a, there's a lot of research being done into how trees benefit us, both our minds and bodies. Um, they provide shade. I, I think it's just nice to be around green things. I don't know if Nick can speak to a little bit more of that, but <laughs> maybe not. Um, they make um, us happy, yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, they sequester carbon. They help retain storm water, just do a lot of things for our communities in a lot of different ways. Kind of along those lines, they make our cities really just livable in, in numerous ways, just like Emily just said, as far as uptaking of, of the stormwater and create getting pollutants out of the air. They also do tons to make a neighborhood feel like a neighborhood and not just a block of houses or, or streets. They cool our cities. They're basically like our natural mm-hmm. air conditioner. Part of the reason that the Urban Forest Initiative, or maybe not the reason it started, but one of the big goals of UFI was, I think, or to get people to realize that they like trees and that when they go down a street, they walk down that shaded side of the street because, yes, there's shade there, but because the trees are there giving them that shade versus walking down that hot side of the street because the trees aren't there. And sometimes we do that and it's subconscious and we don't link that shade to the plants that are there providing that for us. They also create habitat. I know a lot of people aren't thrilled with urban wildlife, <laughs> but at the same time, we, we need it. You know, people love birds and they kind of put birds into that separate like category. Like, that's not really wildlife, but it is. Mm-hmm. And so they're really important and they do so much for just even our houses, small scale like that. They cool our houses in the winter when they drop their leaves, they let the sun shine through, um, which is a really important feature of our deciduous trees. They also help with the water so our backyards don't flood. A lot of people think sometimes that, oh, I've got a tree there, my yard's flooding because that tree's there. Though, when they get rid of that tree, then it's really flooding. They do. They just do a lot, both ecologically as well as economically for us. So you were telling a little bit about your organization. So if you want to go ahead and tell a little bit more about yours. Sure. Within my organization, I'm with the Division of Environmental Services, and we're actually the urban forestry piece of that. There's also an environmental protection piece of that, and there's also a energy initiatives piece of that, and there's also um, like a public outreach and information piece of that, where you always hear about the events that go on. And so with, within our little urban forestry section, we help manage those trees, like I mentioned earlier, and one of our, our main focuses is the median. So there's there's big green spaces down the, the major parts of our roads or even the neighborhoods where, where we have trees. We prune them and maintain them. We mulch them and just make sure that they're overall healthy, one, so they continue to grow and provide everything they do for our city, but also to make sure that they're safe for the pedestrians, not only mm-hmm. walkers, but people in cars. Trees get hit quite a lot, and so we're always having to watch out for that and the damage that's done for those to those trees and we try to mitigate that and keep them but sometimes they will have to be removed and replaced. So what about those street trees that's in front of your house? That's something you don't do, right? So our urban forestry group is actually kind of divided into two sections. One that deals with street trees and development plans and one that deals with what I was talking about, the like mm-hmm. the public space trees. So those trees between your road and your sidewalk are actually the homeowner's responsibility. Mm-hmm. Um, you're required to have them but you're also required to maintain them. In certain neighborhoods, 
If you remove that tree, you're required to get a permit to remove it, and then you have to replace it. There mm -hmm. is financial help out there for people that have to do that. There's a cost share program. You have to apply to it. The only reason for the application is because we only have so much funding, and so mm -hmm. it's really just a first-come, first-served basis. But it is available for everyone. There's even part of a program for people that are a lower income that will take over 100% of the cost. We do have two people in that section that come out and inspect your tree. So either you can call them or oftentimes your neighbors or somebody else <laughs> driving down the street calls because they see a dangerous tree right. or they're worried. And then we'll send someone out to inspect it. They'll get a letter notice saying, you know, you have this going on, either pruning or removal. Contact us for any information, but it is your responsibility to do that. We have over the past three years, I think, received funding. And I can't remember which form this comes in because funding comes in lots of different channels through the city. We have been able to get out in some neighborhoods and do a preventative type of pruning. So it's a service we're providing that we're not required to, but in, in order to get trees into compliance, which is 12 foot over the road and eight foot over the sidewalk, to get trees into those compliance, we can send, we're contracting out crews to go through and make those printings. All of the crews we either have in-house or contract are ISA certified arborists. What that means for people who've never heard of that is that these arborists know how to prune a tree correctly and safely, um, both for the tree and for the people that are surrounding that. I feel like sometimes because we're the city, we're, we're considered to not be the ones that know what we're doing, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> we really do. Yeah. And we really know how to hire the people when we can't do it in-house because of our small crew. We hire based on all the credentials that are necessary for that. That's some great information. Emily, what about your organization? So the Arboretum, I think I had mentioned it's a 100-acre green right. space. It does a lot of things for the community and I think for the state of Kentucky. It's a, the state's botanical garden. It's a restorative and peaceful place. It's a beautiful place to be. It's a place to learn, really importantly. Learn about uh, Kentucky native trees. Learn about what kind of trees and plants you can have in your home landscape um, in Kentucky that grow well here. Uh, and we do a lot of outreach and education, especially the Children's Garden, which is a highly programmed space, especially in the in the summer months. Doing a lot more education programs lately, um, have a, kind of an initiative, a push to get more adult education programs out there. So things like Winter Tree ID and other identification mm -hmm. courses, programs for teachers and are you kind of usual programs and educational events for for children mm -hmm. okay and where can people go to find out about the programs that you have throughout the year so we have a really easy way to do that is mm -hmm. our website okay um, we have yeah. a lot of information on, on our website okay um, especially under like the education tab oh, okay and on the, the home page we also do mailings these calendar on a card so if you sign up or if you're a member of the arboretum mm -hmm. you will get an, a, like a monthly or bi-monthly card that will tell you all of the events that are okay. going on. Okay. Yeah. Mm, that's good. So we have a lot of great events coming up in April, and Nick, if you want to tell us about the event that you have coming up this week on April 3rd. Um, and they're we, all related, to kind of yeah, tree-related, so that's kind of why we have you all in here at all at the same time. So we've been doing a speaker series for the past three or four years where we bring in individuals who are experts in their field of thinking about all the different ways that people and trees interact in cities. But we're really excited on April 3rd to have author and speaker Florence Williams who wrote a bestseller book called The Nature Fix, Why Nature Makes Us Happier, Healthier, and More Creative. She's going to be speaking on Wednesday, April 3rd uh, on UK campus at the Jacobs Science Building, parking in the Rose Street Garage for those of you who are a little bit nervous about coming on campus. I don't blame you. <laughs> But this is a, it's a new building on campus, so it should be a new opportunity to see a new building and hear from a really great speaker who's talking about all the things that we've mentioned already, which, you know, have to do with why we need nature and trees around us in cities for our mental, emotional, uh, physical well-being. Mm -hmm. So that's April 3rd, Florence Williams. It should be a really excellent talk and open to the public, and we hope to see a whole bunch of people come out and uh, listen listen to a great speaker. And tell us those times again. Sure. Um, April 3rd, uh, that's 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Okay. at the Jacobs Science Perfect. Building. And and I know we have another event coming up um, that you do each year, um, Reforce the Bluegrass. Can you tell us a little bit about the Reforce the Bluegrass yes, event? Yes, definitely. Reforce the Bluegrass, for anyone that has not 
ever heard of it or been involved before is an annual event where we plant thousands of tree seedlings using hundreds of volunteer effort. This is actually our 20th year. So we have 20 forests that we've put out throughout Lexington um, over the past 20 years. Some of our sites include Masterson Station and Veterans Park and Jacobson Park, Wellington and Chilito. And this year we're doing our 20th anniversary back at Masterson Station. This will actually be the third planting at this park. If you drive into Masterson Station, there's a little forest you kind of come through before you get into the big part of the park, mm -hmm. both sides of the road there. And that is the planting from, I believe it was 2000. So it's a 19 year old forest there. Before that forest was there, it was nothing but grass. And mm -hmm. so it's amazing to be able to see what can happen in just 19 years. But this year it's April 13th. It is from 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. to 1 p.m. Basically, all you have to do is come out to volunteer and you plant tree seedlings. We always have a big education tent. The tent will be filled with people from all over, from UK and from all over the community, um, just with some education about trees in general or about ways to be involved. We have music and pizza, coffee and donuts. We have a lot of local vendors that, that do in-kind donations. And then we have a number of businesses that are our donors for purchasing the seedlings that we plant. I think this year right now I have about 7,000 tree seedlings that are coming. Um, we hope to get them all on the ground. Mm -hmm. Any that don't, we wind up giving away to different organizations throughout the city, um, and some will go into a, a couple of nurseries that we have to grow up and then put out into the city later. But again, there's food, there's music, there's seedlings, there's giveaways. Um, it's for all ages. We encourage people with small children to come out and start that at a young age, and we make it accessible for even elderly people and everyone in between. There's a playground there at Masterson Station as you come through off to your right across from like the fairgrounds. Mm -hmm. It's behind that playground where the event will be this year. Um, so it's really easy access. There's a driveway right up there. Yeah, it's it's great. We're excited mm -hmm. to have done this for 20 years now and mm -hmm. we're looking forward to doing it again. So again, April 13th, 9 a.m. to 1. And it's a Saturday, so it's, it's yeah, a Saturday. great way to come out. And how do, do people need to register ahead of time or can they just come out or? Sure, you don't have to register ahead of time. We used to run it through like a sign up genius, but now mm -hmm. you can just go into Facebook if you want to register ahead of time and sign in through that way. There is a waiver just for um, safety reasons, mm -hmm. which you can access as well through Facebook. Um, and it's through the Live Green Lexington Facebook page, and it's got all the details of the event there. So yeah, you can sign in ahead of time, but you can also just sign in the day of the event, pick up a t-shirt, pick up your, your swag, and mm -hmm. go out and plant some tree seedlings. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a great activity. I've, mm -hmm. We've been participating for several years in the education tent, and I know some of our forestry students go out and help yeah. as crew leaders. So yeah, it's a, it's a great time. I know I've brought my kids out since they were probably old enough to That's walk right, and help right. planting trees yeah. and stuff. So it's a great activity. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned crew leaders, actually. So the way that we help our um, volunteers come out and plan is we utilize people that are volunteers as well for crew leaders and so all that really entails is being getting a little bit of a training on how you put in the seedlings which is very simple and then just kind of being able to talk to groups of people that you take out about the species we have why we're doing it and what we're putting in the ground which we can help you with all of that and so if anyone's interested in that they can always reach out to me either through you or I can mm -hmm. leave my email address um, mm -hmm. and I'll just set up a time to kind of go over all that stuff with everybody before the event. So if, would you, if you would like to, if you're interested, or even if you have questions about reforest and not wanting to be a crew leader, you can reach me at H. Wilson, that's H-W-I-L-S-O-N, at LexingtonKY.gov. And that's Lexington and all spelled out. Okay, that's great. And I'll, I'll, for those of you um, students that are on campus, you're welcome to contact me. And usually um, we set up a time for you to come mm -hmm. over and, and the students all meet you at once right. and, yep. and get something set up then. So. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. So if someone volunteers for this, do they need to bring a shovel or anything? Nope, you don't need to bring anything, just you. We provide what are called dibble bars, so they're mm -hmm. not actually shovels. You're not actually shoveling dirt out of the ground. You're basically making a little divot of a hole and kind of closing the tree back in. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to bring gloves, you know, you can bring gardening gloves. We do do this rain or shine, snow or sleet. Um, we used to do it in March, and it used to be miserably cold. So I'm glad that we now do it in April. Mm -hmm. But so just come prepared for weather. You know, it may, may be raining, and you'll want a rain jacket. It may be 80 degrees, and you'll be scorching hot. It, it runs the gamut. Last year, I think we had 
a really great morning, and then it started pouring down rain at about 12.30, and it was perfect because it watered all the ceilings in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you had mentioned that crew leaders would be informed on why Reforce the Bluegrass is, mm-hmm. is what it is. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So Reforce the Bluegrass actually stemmed from a water quality initiative way back in the late 1900s. Um, we have all these stream sides all throughout Lexington, and, and most of them were bare from development, or really just some of it because we're in the bluegrass, and it may never have had forests to begin with. But trees do a lot to shade that stream. They they filter the water. They provide habitat for the organisms living in the water, and also habitat for the creatures living around the, the parks. So um, it was started out of a water quality initiative to plant trees along streams. And so for 20 years, we've mostly tried to be near a stream. Sometimes we have to be a little bit off, but we're still within a watershed. And so it still offers that effect. So it stemmed out of the water quality. It lives with us in urban forestry. And it's really just a great marrying of, of water and trees and that relationship and letting the public know, like, it's really important to have these two things together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. Okay, good. And so, Emily, tell us about some of the events coming up in April at the Arboretum. Uh, sure. So... Our biggest event is Arbor Day, um, and that's Mm -hmm. at the end of the month. That is Saturday, April 27th, from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. I think in the past we've had it in the morning, and we kind of switched it up to the afternoon this year. Mm -hmm. But it's one of the biggest events of the Arboretum of the year. City's proclamation of Mm -hmm. Arbor Day, um, there are a lot of, let's see, exhibitors, kind of like an education and exhibitor tent where you Mm -hmm. can learn about trees, learn about plants, herpetology, anything like that. Mm -hmm. There's also a plant giveaway tent, so there'll be several hundred plants that you will be able to get for free if you come to the Arboretum. We have, it's at the Arboretum, Mm -hmm. so a beautiful place to walk around Mm -hmm. on on a day to kind of remember and think about trees. There's also going to be a couple more education events during Arbor Day. So we'll have a tree planting mm-hmm. in the children's garden. We're going to be, I'm going to be doing two tours of our bluegrass region, talking about like the history of the bluegrass region and some of the trees in our collection. Let's see, we also, so the theme this year is spreading roots. And we have three events that are kind of leading up to Arbor Day throughout April. So the first is April 11th, um, and these are all from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. First is April 11th, it's called Tracing Roots. So Dave Leonard, um, a arbor- uh, consulting arborist, is going to be using his air spade to actually uncover the, mm. the roots of a few trees that we had taken down earlier this year because of storm damage. Mm. So people actually get to see how far the roots go in oh, a tree, yeah. which I think will be really cool. On Thursday, April 18th, I will be doing a Discovering Roots class, which is basically I'm going to be uncovering kind of original collection maps from the Arboretum um, in the Bluegrass region and in the Arboretum woods and talking about kind of the history of the Arboretum, the history of specifically the walk across Kentucky, which is 80 acres of native plants that were, they're all actually wild collected. So when I say collection maps, I mean actually where they were collected from in Kentucky. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah which I think will be really interesting. Mm-hmm. And then uh, our third event is Rooted in Nature, which will be, I think, Wednesday, April 24th. And that will be learning about the latest research in child uh, and nature connection oh, okay. and the Kentucky Children's Garden. And all of those are uh, posted on our website. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Sounds like we have some great events coming up in April. A lot to learn about trees and stuff. Okay, I just have to ask this. What's the difference between an urban tree and a forest tree? So the very core, nothing. The the (laughs) trees are the same. Trees are kind of generally thought to to evolve and exist and grow up together in a forest. There's a progression to that. Mm -hmm. There's your early successional species, and then they age up basically into what we consider forest aid species, like our oaks and such. So trees in the forest grow up in competition, and it's good competition. If we think about our kids, like we're siblings, you know, siblings Mm -hmm. grow up competing constantly, and and I think it makes us for really residual people. So when trees grow up in competition, they're competing for light resources from the sun. They're also competing for water resources in the soil as well as from nutrients. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is it kind of weeds out the trees that aren't going to make it. So it kind of produces these good, strong trees. When you see a tree in the forest, you see a very strong, long, tall, straight tree with not a whole lot of branches down low. Those leaves basically make food for that branch and then to the tree. Mm -hmm. And so when that branch is costing the tree more by having leaves and trying to make food, it basically lets it go. So in the forest, they're not getting enough light, so they're not making enough food for the tree, and so they let it go naturally. So you get these long straight trees. In the urban setting, you have what are considered open grown trees. So they don't have competition for light. And so they get these big wide open crowns, which is beautiful, but it makes a lot of problems for the trees. And that's why we often have trees breaking, 
because they're going to do that anyway. They get rid of those weak branches, but they also don't have, they get a lot of weight on these lower limbs that they wouldn't naturally have in a forest setting. And mm. so that's really why you have to prune them because they're not doing it themselves. Those, all those branches are contributing lots of food to that tree. And so it, they're not going to let them go, but they can get really heavy and they break off because they're not really meant to hold on to for the long term. Um, there are some exceptions. Baroque is an exception to that for the most part, I believe. Um, blue ash might be another one. But that's why they get all kind of funky looking later because they have these massive, really cool branches, but they don't have a lot of that little stuff in between. As far as soil in the forest, trees grow in really rich soils. Their, their soils are fluffy, they're not compact. When they drop their leaves, their leaves stay on the ground and decompose and refeed that soil and they have all the micro and macrobiotic creatures living in that soil, really producing really rich soil. And in the city, that doesn't happen. We have grass up to our trees, we mow mm. our lawn, we get rid of all those leaves, which are what are really important for refeeding that soil. They also have the compaction from development, from us walking on them, from vehicles driving across them, like in our parks, when vehicles may have to get to some of those trees deeper in the parks. And so the big, big problem for them is compaction. And that causes a lot of problems for the roots. Um, a tree's, I don't mean to take up all the time from you guys, a tree's <laughs> feeder roots basically are right really close to the tree within what's considered the drip line of the tree, which is like the edge of the canopy. And so your feeder roots are in there. And of course, that's the part of the soil that we drive across. They're only within the couple, maybe six inches of soil. And so every time you drive over them, you're basically creating cement over those little feeder roots. Mm. The deep roots everyone's familiar with, they go down. They're more for anchoring. They're not really for feeding the tree. Mm. And so when you don't give them nutrients back and you drive back over that soil, the trees are really already struggling. And so the forest trees don't have that issue. Forest trees have their own issues. You know, they've got wind throw and they've got soils that'll upheave because they are nice and fluffy. And they have a lot of pests and insects that will come through them that you know, the urban trees don't maybe have to deal with us as much because we're here managing them. And then as far as water, and there's really good soils, it retains the water, and they can tap into underground water resources. And in the city, half the time our soils have been turned over through development, and they're not getting those underground water resources. The water is rolling off because our soils are compact, and so they're also struggling for water competition from that as well as from the grasses that they're growing among. A lot of people try to mitigate that with mulch. The new thinking, or the current thinking, I guess, is that coarse wood chip mulch is better for the for trees to be placed around their trunks. Because it's coarse, it lets water percolate through, and then all that decomposition that usually happens with the semi-decomposed mulch, the pretty stuff that we bring in, is all happening right there at the base of that tree. And so all that decomposition is going into the soil there and feeding those roots. They're also providing protection to the roots and the soil and the trunk of that tree from mowers and string trimmers. So at its core, no. Urban and <laughs> forest-grown trees are the same tree, mm -hmm. but the environment that they grow in is very different, so it creates very different recommendations and requirements. Trees can be overloved in the city too, I think. Okay. Um, the big key is water, I think, in that sense. Trees roughly need about an inch of water a week. When they're young, when we're first putting them in, they might need a little bit more. And when they're really old and they're in a really stressed environment, they might need a little bit more. But no more than about an inch a week. And when we're raining, when we get lots of rain, like we've been inundated with over the past year, trees don't need any extra water. Because they can also present like they're wilting from drought, and it's because the ground is basically, their roots are basically um, rotted, and so they're not being able to pull up water when they get too much water. Oh, okay. It's kind of like a nice fine line in there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if I said so much. <laughs> you know, it reminded me um, of, like, at the Arboretum, we have the Arboretum Woods, and then we have you know, the Arboretum proper, like the, the Walk Across Kentucky and the Horticultural Gardens. Mm -hmm. And the Arboretum Woods is a, you know, 15-acre remnant bluegrass woodland. Just like comparing the trees that are in the Arboretum Woods to the trees that in the walk across Kentucky, you can really see that difference that Heather is talking about. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, I think, is that, you know, the trees from the walk across Kentucky are from seed collected from trees all over the state of Kentucky because it represents the seven physiographic regions of Kentucky. So those trees are from that seed that may be from the Arboretum Woods or from somewhere in the Red River Gorge, but growing in our Appalachian Plateau region on the walk. You can see it in our beech trees. They, are, they do have that kind of the heavy lower branches that you don't usually see in the forest. So, so we've got a, a lot of dates coming up in April. Let's just go through one more time and maybe say the website that you are associated with and remind our listeners about those upcoming events, just so everyone can okay. get their pens and paper out and, <laughs> and write down some of those events that we yeah, okay, up. April 3rd, the Urban Forest Initiative is hosting author Florence Williams to give a talk at the Jacob Science Building called The Nature Fix. It's about her popular book, The Nature Fix, 
why nature makes us happier, healthier, and more creative uh, should be a really great talk. And I'm going to just share my favorite piece of research that, that has to do with health and trees. And that is a study at um, the University of Berkeley took two groups of people. The only difference between these two groups was the view that they had on campus, okay? One group was told to look at just the front of a nearby science building, just the, the front of a building, think brick and stone. And the other group was told to go into a grove of nearby uh, really tall eucalyptus trees. Emily, never mind the fact that eucalyptus is an invasive species. <laughs> <laughs> but what they found and what they were actually measuring, unbeknownst to these people with these two different views, was that after a minute of looking at either the building or the trees, they were approached by the research technician who accidentally, quote unquote, spilt a uh, tub of pencils. And so unbeknownst to the viewers, what they were measuring was the likelihood of these people to help pick up these pencils in this accident. And this was published in a, a journal of psychology. And what they found was that the people who, with the greener views who were looking at trees were much more likely to help clean up these pencils. And so as, you know, as, as research scientists do, they made up a, a really complicated term saying, trees and nature lend to pro-social behavior. Uh, but what that really means is that we're more likely to help each other out when we have greenery around us. So that leads into our speaker who's talking about human health and wellness and what that has to do with being surrounded by trees. So that's a long-winded answer, but uh, April 3rd, Florence Williams uh, on campus, come out and hear her speak and talk about that interesting fact. And what time was that again? 6 to 8 p.m. 6 to 8 p.m. Okay. April 3rd. Okay. I think too, Nick, you wanted to maybe mention the website, and I just want to pipe in here real quick. Because of UFI's website in general, just having been on it, it's full of really great information. It's full of information about the people that are involved with UFI as well as the numerous activities that UFI puts on. There's also some ways that students can become directly involved through the adoptions of trees. But Nick can certainly speak more to that. Um. Thank you, Heather. <laughs> keep forgetting to mention the website. Um, please visit us on our website if this speaker has already passed. We, we do a lot of events like this. So check out our website. That is uh, ufi, U-F-I dot C-A dot U-K-Y dot E-D-U. And that has all of our events and current happenings on the website. I'm also going to take this minute to plug a little bit more for UFI. Um, <laughs> only because it's in conglomeration with the city, mm -hmm. we have our second tree week that we are in the beginning stages of planning for this coming year. Yeah. Um, if anyone didn't involve themselves with tree week last year, it was the second full week of October. Is it going to be in October again? It is. It's basically yeah. the same time frame. The ending date is the 19th. I can't remember the start date. Maybe the 12th. That's right. Okay. Um, <laughs> and so basically, if for anyone that's not familiar with it, it is a week-long event series of events really actually just celebrating trees and people in trees and trees and spaces and again kind of just creating that um, connection for people to trees in whatever way they feel that connection. Last year we ran between all of us uh, the whole UFI working group the, Earth, mm -hmm. the UFI core team as well as the city and the Arboretum and the numerous entities out there. Um, we had activities ranging from tree plantings to a bike ride to a tree climbing competition which is part of the International Society of Arboriculture, but through our Kentucky Arborist Association, that's a lot of letters and, and names there, <laughs> through a conglomeration of them. We also had painting among the trees and yoga with the trees, plantings on campus. There were some demonstrations about how to properly prune. Public library had Public library tree had themed. Um, numerous events, yeah. So look again for that for this coming October, and the Urban Forest Initiative website is where you will find all the information for that. The other really cool thing about that is that it's not limited to the people who want to put it on events. If you have any connection that you want to share either personally with the public or through your business and related to trees, all you have to do is contact the UFI website and say, I have this great idea for an event. I'd really like to be involved. And then what UFI does is basically provides the marketing for that for you. Mm -hmm. um, we don't help you get people or volunteers, um, but we will definitely help get it out there into the public so that more and more people know about it. So it's good you mentioned it because somebody might need to be planning something now right. for October. Yes, yes yep. exactly, yep. exactly. So it looks like we have another show in yeah, October. Yeah, we'll <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. Right. So what about you and Reforest the Bluegrass? You can give us the details of it again and your information. Sure. So Reforest the Bluegrass, again, is April 13th. 
Um, again, this is annual. This is our 20th planting. It will be at Master Sensation Park, which is at Leestown Road. It runs from 9 until 1. We're not going to cut it off at 1. If people are still out there and they're wanting to plant, there will certainly still be people there helping. You're provided with all the materials you need to plant. You're provided with the seedlings. We have 7,000 that we would love to get into the ground. Um, it would be awesome if we did, but it's okay if we don't because we'll find them homes. There will be giveaways. There's food. Usually there's pizza. I believe this year we have barbecue coming from maybe the Paul Miller group. We have drinks, of course, and t-shirts and a big education tent. It's a lot of fun. There's music. I think it's the Swells this year that we have playing with us, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> they actually played for us at um, the planting we did at Heisel two years ago. So they'll be doing that again with us. And if you want more information ahead of time, you can go to Live Green Lexington Facebook page. You can also go through the city's website to find some details, but it'll still direct you probably to the, the Live Green Facebook page. And you okay. can register ahead of time or at the at the time you come. You just come on um, out. Yeah, and actually Laura mentioned earlier, and I, I wanted to mention this, we do get numerous Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops. Last year, I believe we had a naval recruit crew there mm -hmm. who planted tons of seedlings for us. Mm -hmm. It was great to have them there. All kinds of groups individuals to large group organizations, more than welcome. And if you volunteer, you can stay as little or as long as you want yes. to, correct? Yep. Okay. You can come plant one seedling, you can plant all day long, it's completely up to you. Mm -hmm. If it's raining, you don't have to come, but we'd love for you to be out there. Yeah. <laughs> Great, how about you? Our Arboretum, you know, our big uh, Arbor Day, Saturday, April 27th from one o'clock to 4 p.m., a really good family-friendly family -friendly event. And then the three workshops leading up to that, uh, tracing Roots, Discovering Roots and Rooted in Nature, April 11th, April 18th, and April 24th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Those are pre-registration events, mm -hmm. um, and you can go to our website um, at arboretum.ca.uky.edu. Learn more about uh, the different events in April. Great. Can they register yeah. there, too? No. no. They have to um, call to register. Either call 859-257-6955, or you can email arboretum um, at uky.edu. Okay, mm -hmm. great. All right, so y'all have presented us with a lot of great information, and usually we try to give our listeners one or two takeaway items for anything that we do. So I'm starting with Nick, if you have any. I guess just if you're listening to this and you're surrounded by trees, take a minute to realize what it would be like if you weren't. It's kind of stark. To Sometimes trees and plants and nature sort of fades into the background and we don't think about them. And Heather spoke to this earlier. But um, they're always there and they're always doing things for us. So take a minute to just recognize that, I guess. And appreciate that they're mm -hmm. there. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, just, just kind of building on, on what Nick said. Um, trees are there to grow. They're there to grow, we say, for us, because mm -hmm. we share this world with them. Um, but they're one of the few things that you can ever put into the ground or build that will increase in its value through time. As it gets older, it provides more and more services for us. It, it saves us a lot more money in the long run. Um, and as far as infrastructure goes, Trees definitely decline and they and they fall apart to, in, in certain instances, but trees are designed to grow. They mm -hmm. don't necessarily have an end of life. And so oftentimes when we have troubles with trees, it's only because of where they are in relation to where we are. Mm -hmm. And so they run into impacts with sidewalk or with buildings or with cars. And so that affects them. But even though they're losing branches or they may not look like this perfect symmetrical tree, they're still highly functional and they're still highly important for our, for our environment and our community. Um, and I think it's just important to, to start to realize, like, you don't need that perfect tree. Every tree is perfect. Um, and it's just, it's how you look at what's around you. We forget sometimes to appreciate what we have and kind of work around what's being given to us. And just like Nick said, we'd be in trouble without trees. And mm -hmm. it's oftentimes, I used to work for a private company, and it was many times that a client would request the tree to be removed. And then once that tree was gone, they realized what they just lost. Mm -hmm. But it's not until it's gone until you realize. And so... Sometimes we have to just stand back and think of all the things that that tree is doing for us. Um, and then just one last thing about the city. If you guys ever have questions about trees, I can't necessarily help you on your private property, like your backyard or your front yard. But if there's ever a park or a median or even the street trees that you all have questions with, feel free to reach out to us at Urban Forestry with Environmental Services. You can call LexCall at 311 and they can put you in direct contact with us. We're more than happy to talk to you about trees and ways we can keep trees or if there's anything that needs to be done. Sometimes trees have to come down. It's just a matter of mm -hmm. living in the city. But there's ways that we can mitigate the loss of that as well. What about you? Sort of the same sentiment, building off of Nick and Heather. Um, mm -hmm. Plants 
are not optional. They are necessary for our survival, they're necessary for our social, economic, ecological resiliency of our landscapes. We're an urban environment here, talking about urban trees, but also the conservation of natural spaces throughout Kentucky, throughout the United States, throughout the world really is uh, just hugely important for everyone's well-being <laughs> and the sustainability of life on Earth. Good. Good. I think community-wide, even mm-hmm. outside of Kentucky, this is, it's not only a growing sentiment, and a lot of places already know this, but I think it is growing in communities all throughout the states. All right. Well, thank you, Nick, Heather, and Emily, for joining us today. And if you'd like more information on what you heard, please visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome to a new edition of Extension Notes. I'm Renee Williams, and today's topic is about R3. And just to refresh you a little bit about Extension Notes, if you haven't heard other shows, it's a short segment about one of our Extension faculty or staff or what they're doing in his or her area of expertise. Today we have someone in studio that you're all familiar with, Dr. Matt Springer. He is an Assistant Extension Professor of Wildlife Management in our Department of Forestry and Natural Resources here at UK. And uh, Dr. Springer has brought with him Becky Wallen, who is a Field to Fork Coordinator with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So welcome to the studio. And so most people won't know what R3 is, including me. So if you can explain that, we would greatly appreciate it. Yeah, so R3 is recruitment, retention, and reactivation, specifically talking about hunting and angling. It's also um, kind of a mindset and a philosophy that the Department of Fish and Wildlife has recently adopted Mm -hmm. and integrated into everything, every decision the department makes, so in, in all departments, really. So Becky, you know, we have activities here through Extension uh, working with you on R3. We have a program right now through University of Kentucky with our undergraduates. Can you speak a little bit to how R3 fits into the mission of Fish and Wildlife and why we should actually care about recruiting or reactivating hunters and fisher people? (laughs) Okay, yeah. So our mission statement at the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife is to conserve enhanced fish and wildlife resources and provide opportunity Um, to participate in all of the activities that go along with those resources. R3 is directly related to our mission statement in that we're um, encouraging people to get involved and introducing people into the activities. We're kind of stepping in as the mentor where there has been a couple generations that have grown up without somebody in their household or direct friends that were hunters or anglers. So hmm. the department is serving as that as that uh, role model for them. And as I understand that part of the mentor, that has a lot to do with the changing in society and culture that used to produce hunters and fishers, it was, uh, fishermen, fisher people, <laughs> right, and get the gender neutrality here, <laughs> where most folks traditionally learned from their parents because hunting and fishing was an activity that was common upwards of, what, 50% of households about three generations ago? Yeah. And now it's down to about 5% of the population, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So we're, you're trying to get that number back up. And why is that number really important to what you guys do? It goes back to the way that we're funded. Uh, Fish and wildlife agencies are funded through the North American model of wildlife conservation. And basically that is based off of the license number that we sell and um, the excise tax on hunting and fishing equipment. And so if people aren't participating and aren't buying a license and aren't um, purchasing the equipment to participate in the activities, then there's no funding for conservation. And this is, a, this is a national concern. So yeah, so bigger picture outside of just, you know, people getting engaged in hunting and fishing is that this is actually matters for species that aren't hunted or fished, like your songbirds that uh, rely on the habitat that's created by the money that's generated from hunting and fishing dollars. Yes, definitely. definitely. So that's the bigger picture why we should care. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. So can you talk a little bit about some of the things you guys do within the R3 program to try to uh, attract po- folks to either hunting or fishing? Yeah, so um, I'll talk specifically about uh, the program that I coordinate, Field to Fork. It is a program for adults who are interested in hunting. We focus on deer hunting, turkey hunting, squirrel hunting is new this year, and dove hunting. 
Um, and we've also had a waterfowl class. So for someone who has no foundation at all in, in any of that, they can come to our class, learn about the biology of the animal, the hunting regulations, the habitat, hunting tactics, and then um, we go even farther with the field to fork and teach them all of the post-harvest process. So how do you get the meat on your table to share with your friends and family? You know, I mentioned we're doing this program within the university here, and this is the university radio. So we're we're currently hosting a field to fork for wild turkeys this spring. We've gone through, we recruited several students that went through the process here the last couple months. That has gone well enough that we're going to try to do this in the fall for white-tailed deer. So if you have any interest in that as a student, if you're listening, please contact me at uh, Matt Springer at uky.edu or find us through the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources webpage and, and reach out to us. Uh, and I can share some information. But for folks that are listening in the public, is there a way to find out about these classes? Where should they go if they're interested? Yeah, so I do have a Field to Fork page on, at the fw.ky.gov website for Fish and Wildlife. And then they can also email me at becky.wallen at ky.gov um, to find out about upcoming courses. But we do post them all uh, on our webpage. And we're, we're focusing a little bit more on hunting here, but there's fishing related activities that are the same thing, right? So um, if you have interest in that, they can reach out to you and you'll put them in touch with the fishing side of folks yep. as well. Yep. And are those going on year round or are there certain times of year that they happen more often? The field to fork courses are almost year round because we try to take advantage of the um, anywhere from the early September bow season for deer. We've got obviously spring turkey, squirrel's gonna be in the summer, all the way through late muzzleloader, which is in December for deer. So we try to have something going on uh, year round. Of course, fishing is when the weather's right. <laughs> um, the guys at in aquatic education are really amping up getting poles and reels ready and they're getting the kayaks out and making sure they've got all their gear together. Um, so they also do, in addition to The sister program, Hook and Cook, they also do Kayak Fishing 101, um, which is really popular. A lot of these programs or classes that you're having, is it all over the state or is it just generalized in specific areas? Well, we do try to spread out as much as possible across the state, but we do have a focus in the Louisville, Lexington, and and northern Kentucky areas. Mm -hmm. Now, why would you focus in those? I mean, obviously that's where the majority of our population is, but why? Is there a reason specifically you guys would target that outside of the number of people? Well, there is a lot of urbanization, obviously, in those areas, and so people tend to be um, less connected to nature and to the activities that we're trying to promote. So those are the population tends to be less uh, licensed per se for the things like hunting and fishing. So yeah. they'd be more likely to, to try to recruit them and get them going. So Becky, um, you mentioned that you, you go from start to finish. Now, do you guys actually, you, you said mentoring earlier. That doesn't sound like a lot of actual mentoring. That sounds a lot of teaching. Where does that mentoring aspect really come in with uh, these programs specifically? Let's talk about the university and how we do things at the university. The mentoring really comes in during the mentored hunt. So there's That's, actually there's a mentored hunt. So there's not just classroom time. There's a, there's a hosted mentored hunt associated with this. So right. there's field time, basically. There's field time. So you get outside. <laughs> yes. okay. okay. And that's critical for the first time hunter is to be in the field with someone who is experienced that can share their knowledge, skills, and past experiences. It's easy to look at a picture of a scrape or a rub made by a, a deer, but then you don't really know what you're looking at until you see it in the field. A lot of this really comes down to, and the fishing is probably the same way, where you actually want to go out and do the do the actual activity with someone there that can tell you if you're doing it wrong. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> or if you're doing it right, which is probably more important because most right. folks don't even know the difference. Yes. Um, so usually when they have those, are they a weekend activity where you get um, folks that are similar age, you know, gender? Um, you guys have a program. Um, Bo, becoming an outdoors woman. Yes, we where you, do. So um, where you have women that actually help mentor other women to, to make that uh, transition a little easier in some cases. Those hunts are all part of you do the class and then you get to try to organize the hunt and do the same time, right? So that's yes. how it kind of works. Is and it then, one-on-one or are there is it a group of people? Traditionally, it's one-on-one. Okay. Mm-hmm. Where you meet as a group and then break down into one-on-one mentors. Right. Okay. Yep. Um, so we've got the base camp hunt camp atmosphere where we're all together and planning our locations and looking at maps and um, then we just uh, we break up for the hunt and everybody goes to their spot that they selected with the help of their mentor and uh, we reconvene after the hunt and tell all the stories about what we saw or didn't see and what went wrong I'm sure (laughs) because that's usually how my hunting stories go Um, and so then after that 
is that like after they've actually got a deer or hooked a fish, <laughs> then is that when you show them the rest of it? Or have you already showed them previously on how to, in theory, on how to clean a deer or a fish? So if we can, and most of the time it works out, we do show them prior to the hunt how to process the animals. And it, it's very hands-on. You know, everybody puts gloves on and everybody gives it a try. And we walk them through step by step. Of course, if they harvest something in the field, the mentor is right there to help begin the process. And then we try to bring the animals all together with everybody to reinforce the knowledge and mm-hmm. let them break down the animals that they've harvested. Game meat is the most healthiest meat you can get, uh, you know, shown over and over again that when, it, you know, you take the wild animal and compare it to the agriculturally produced one, it's always healthier. Most so. definitely. So you were mentioning about, um, you know, going out and doing some of the hunting. And where do you do that? What um, what lands do you go out to? Traditionally, we take the, the new hunters on public land, which is great because, you um, not everybody owns a farm or knows somebody that owns a farm or land to hunt on. So we focus on public land, which is a great resource. There's over 800,000 acres of public land in Kentucky that the um, that is owned and operated by the, uh, either the state agency or the federal government. It's all available for new hunters and anglers to get out and take advantage of. Um, but sometimes we do get a great opportunity to go on some private land um, and, and take advantage of that, too. Okay, good. And it, just um, to clarify for our listeners, if they are interested, where do they go to register for this? They can find all of the upcoming courses and the registration information on our webpage, fw.ky.gov. And there's our education tab. We've got Learn to Hunt, Shoot, and Fish. You'll find it right there. Okay, great. Thank you. Can you speak real quick, and we're, we're running out of time here, to some of the successes you guys had? You've, this is a multi-year program now. Um, are you getting hunters involved? Are they continuing to hunt afterwards? Um, yeah. Is there a community that's coming together? Do you guys have those kind of resources? Yeah, so um, Field of Fork has shown time and time again that it, it is a success where we are able to track our um, new hunters and see if they purchase a license year after year, if they harvest an animal, and they are. And all usually all it takes is one workshop and That's enough information, and possibly they participate in the mentored hunt um, after the workshop, and they're ready to go. They're ready to get out in the field. They've got all the skills they need to harvest an animal by themselves, get the meat on the table. So as far as the community goes, we do have a closed Facebook group that anyone who participates in our program is welcome to join, and we encourage them. It's a closed group of past participants and mentors who have helped with the program. And this allows for that comfortable um, community where people can ask questions that they might not feel comfortable doing on the main uh, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Facebook page. And the name of the page I'm speaking of is the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Legacy Programs page. We encourage them to kind of get digital mentorship out of that. For those students that are out there maybe listening that have an interest in this, uh, I'm going to mention again, we're going to offer this program in the fall 2019. If, so if you're going to be around and have an interest in, in potentially participating and want to learn more about it, please contact uh, either myself, uh, Matt Springer, at uky.edu, all one word. Find me on our Department of Forestry and Natural Resource webpage. Information's there, either my office number or my email. Or you can go directly to your webpage, which you can mm-hmm. hear say it again, Becky. Yep, it's fw.ky.gov. And that also has information on ongoing courses, how to register, uh, anything that may go into that, um, whether mm-hmm. there's um, some paperwork uh, costs or whatever else that, you know, that yeah. they would potentially need, what they may need to bring, where they are, that kind of stuff. Right. Okay. Well, thanks for quickly talking about this and uh, really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us today, and we have a new show schedule for spring 2019. You can listen to us live on WRFL 88.1 FM on Mondays from 11 a.m. to noon. And if you miss the Monday shows, you can listen to our podcasts on our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Hey there. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, You may enjoy our live radio stream at WRFL.FM and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area.
We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to wrfl.fm slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.